around July or August last last year called Hail. Uh, and it actually began when uh, myself and Cottonseed and a third member of the Neil Lab, Alex Blumendahl, all joined the Bird Institute together uh, directly from postdocs in theoretical math at MIT and Harvard. I think we were all looking to find ways to take our sort of theoretical background, but then deploy it in ways that might have some impact on the real world in our lifetimes. Uh, and genetics seemed like a really exciting space to, to start thinking about that. And so in particular, uh, in talking to Ben Neal, uh, we learned quite quickly that a core challenge uh, in genetics was dealing with the sheer scale of the amount of data that was now being produced, uh, especially sequencing data for exomes and genomes, and data that wanted, we would want to analyze uh, altogether in order to do things like dissociation studies. And so we, we took on that challenge when we came in to think about you know, how, how could we make it easier to learn from all this data. And that's what the HAIL project has become in the last year. So it's an open source framework for scalable genomic analysis. Scale is not the only aspect. I'll touch on a number of things, but it's certainly one of the central aspects. All right. So at Broad, uh, there are a number of programs, different domains in biology that Broad focuses on. And one of them is the medical and population genetics program, which includes uh, Ben Neal RPI and others like Daniel MacArthur and Mark Daly, uh, who Dennis works with, uh, and, and a number of others across Boston. And their mission is to understand how genetic variation contributes to susceptibility to human disease and to an individual's response to therapy. Right? So, of course, this is a mission that is shared by all sorts of institutes uh, around the world. And the way in which uh, we approach doing that, in part, is by collecting a lot of genetic data. Uh, and the more data we have, the more diverse this data is, the better we might be able to op you know, deliver on this mission. So in addition to the genetic data, which is just the sequences from, say, tens of thousands of individuals, uh, there's other pertinent data, which is on, um, say, this horizontal axis, the variant axis, uh, genome biology. That is, there's a lot of molecular biology and genomic biology, which goes to teasing apart what the functional consequences might be of genetic variation. The, the best example just being the central dogma, knowing how codons become amino acids and proteins. So, you know, this is a loss of function variant, or this is a, a, a synonymous variant, and so on. But... In general, it's helpful to know as much as possible about the uh, consequences of genetic variation at the level of the genome and the cell uh, in order to aggregate signal. On the other axis, there's data that we care about, which is uh, indexed by samples, by individuals, and that's typically phenotypic data, so disease status, uh, height. Uh, you know, looking ahead, you know, Think about electronic medical records and all the data that's in there. Uh, and I think, you know, at the same time as the genetic data is growing, the diversity and richness of the data on each of these axes is also exploding. So I mentioned electronic health records, for example, and individuals, but you could also imagine measuring gene expression across these individuals, which happens in GTEx and other large consortia. On the genome biology side, you know, we have tools like VEP, which gives us all sorts of rich annotation, and then lots of other tools that attempt to predict functional consequence, uh, for example. In addition to all the work that goes on to tease apart gene networks uh, and, and so on. So there's lots of rich data here that we want to bring together, and ultimately it's about connecting that yellow box and that blue box using the green box at a very high level, right? We want to understand mechanistically what's happening at the level of the genome and cells and tissues in order to understand how we can diagnose, treat, and cure disease at the level of phenotype. Okay, so if we want to do this well, it's going to be important to efficiently develop and share methods at scale. And that's about the fanciest animation I can make in Python, I'm sorry, in, in PowerPoint, actually in Keynote. Uh, but a challenge is uh, is exactly this scale. It presents amazing opportunities to have statistical power to apply or to apply advances in machine learning uh, on very big data. I run, a, I run a seminar at the Broad called Models, Inference, and Algorithms, where each week we, we brainstorm, we have speakers come in, we talk about what are 
the ways in which we can bring more math, statistics, and machine learning to bear on our biological problems. Uh, but even getting started, having the infrastructure to do simple things on data that's as big as it's become uh, is a challenge, let alone the fancy things. And to get a sense of how, how this data is growing, here's a plot that shows this year, um, up through this year, the, the growth in uh, the data generated, uh, the number of exomes, genomes, and transcriptomes. And the main point of this slide is that the curve is very much exponential, and, and the platform estimates that the amount of uh, genetic data that we are producing at the Broad in particular is doubling about every eight months. So think about that when you look at this slide, which describes where it scales today. So some of our larger genetic data sets right now, we have 20,000 whole genomes coming together in the top med uh, study that's going to keep growing. Uh, similar actually in NOMAD, this recent resource uh, for whole genome aggregation, building on XAC has uh, also 20,000 whole genomes. Now we're talking about you know, hundreds of millions of variants, many tens of terabytes of compressed genetic data in the form of a variant call file. And with exomes, of course, we have even more, uh, 200,000 approximately in second version of XAC. And, and genotype arrays, we have the most samples, although you know, the amount of data per individual is quite small relative to sequencing technology. So the UK Biobank has half a million samples. The uh, Million Veterans pro Program is another example with half a million that will grow to a million. And there are you know, entire countries that we're now embarking on genotyping everyone in coordination with public health systems to learn more about how we can give better health care. And then all of the progress in beginning to use this data is sort of stimulating even more investment. So here, for example, is the Precision Medicine Initiative. It's going to sequence a million people's whole genomes. Great. So how, how do we analyze data now? Well, the answer is that it's quite similar to how we've done it for the last decade. And, and it's actually worked really well uh, for the last decade, producing all kinds of cool science. Uh, what do we use? We use Unix pipelines. Uh, we use centralized storage on um, high performance computing frameworks where uh, you know you you submit lots of lots of jobs to EQ. Uh, data formats typically are, are flat text files, sometimes those are compressed. And our programming models are primarily single node node uh, programming models to create single node tools, things like R and Python, which are about using typically one core on one computer or maybe multi-threading. But these, these technologies have drawbacks in the context of the scale of the data we have now. So Unix pipelines, they're inherently serial. Uh, you can pipe things, it's a beautiful abstraction, but that's not a parallelizable approach. Uh, centralized storage creates bottlenecks on disk, disk bandwidth, pulling all that data out to all the computers that you want to then compute on it with. Flat text files are very challenging to break apart and compute on. Uh, they're not naturally indexed except perhaps by line, but if you have something like a BCF, which is indexed by where each line is a variant, and you want to compute something per variant, well, in that case, you could manually shard and send the pieces to a bunch of computers, run separate jobs, bring them back together. But now, suppose you want to aggregate statistics for each sample. Well, that's more or less the transpose of the data within the file format, and that's you know, quite hard to do, and let alone doing things that are inherently not naively parallelizable, where uh, you know, you want to compute principal components or run an interesting machine learning model. It's, it's near impossible to think about how to do that in a context where uh, you have little pieces of your data and com computations going on that are unable to talk to each other as they do it. And I think, you know, while there, have, there are examples of very uh, effective single node tools like Plink in this space, uh, we're very much seeing these breaking down in the face of uh, terabytes of data. They're not scaling. And why aren't they scaling? Well, I gave you a bunch of reasons. Um, but essentially, it's because individual computers are not getting faster as quickly as the cost of sequencing is going down. So we, we, we certainly have all recognized that for data this big, we need to be using many computers in parallel to increase disk bandwidth, memory, and compute. But it's very challenging to do this using the current set of tools uh, that we're using. And in particular, the most cost-efficient way to do this, industry has found, is to use commodity hardware. But now if you're using lots and lots of computers, you have to deal with things like fault tolerance. Uh, 
because if you're running a job on a thousand computers, chances are one piece may fail along the way and you don't want to have to start everything again from scratch because that, that happened. Also, models for programming that involve taking advantage of many computers in a sort of distributed way, they're, they're not you know, so easy or simple to reason about if you're not used to it. And so analysts, by necessity, to cope with the scale of the data, they're engaging with more and more of this low-level distributed engineering on top of the old technologies to manually cut up the BCFs, distribute jobs, babysit the queue, and they're, in a way, reinventing the wheel over and over again uh, to meet the needs of their one particular project, but in ways that aren't, say, engineered to the level that they're easily shared and used by others, and not always so well tested and very time consuming. So there's a sort of wastefulness to this way of going about things. And so, and finally, these approaches, as we discussed, are only really feasible for computations that are embarrassingly parallel, right? So that limits our, our imagination on what we might do to learn from the data. All right, so uh, there's a good news, which is that our data actually isn't that big, at least not in the broader context. So in the context of biology, it's probably the biggest data there, had, there is, these big whole genome genetic data sets, for example, but in the context of tech, uh, our data is tiny. So by 2012, Google, the web index of Google had about 100 petabyte, petabytes indexed, and you could search in a fraction of a second that entire, that entire index and uh, get back your result. Here you see 56 million results for genome returned in 0.44 seconds. So it isn't necessary that we have to reinvent the wheel kind of ourselves when you have decades of, uh, you know, very um, large amounts of resources and engineering talent going into creating technologies that allow us to work with big data in a productive way. So we should leverage that. And here are just some examples of these kinds of technologies. There's many of them began inside uh, companies, but then the open source community or the company itself created it outside in a, in a manner that anyone can go and use for free. So we have fault tolerant distributed storage. The Google file system was the, one of the earlier versions in 2003 and then Hadoop is a very uh, ubiquitous one now. Uh, fault tolerant distributed computation, MapReduce uh, is an earlier paradigm for that. Spark is a newer one, which is in memory, more geared toward uh, machine learning and data analysis. Uh, distributed column stores rather than flat text files. Distributed databases and query optimizers. Uh, scalable search. So these, these technologies are not that new, actually. Uh, actually, I had another one on this slide that I somehow lost, Kudu, 2015, on the binary column stores. What I want to point out is that in Hale, which I'm now going to introduce, we, we actually take advantage of, of all of these in various ways for various purposes. Uh, and, and where there are elements that are needed that aren't where what they've built in the context of these open source technologies is not quite the right match for our domain, then we just go and build uh, our own. So what is Hale? So it's a scalable, reliable framework and a language for doing genetic data analysis. And it's fully open source under very active development here, but also with collaborators. And uh, at the Broad, at this point, we can say that it, it has very widespread adoption, in particular for the larger Exome and, sequencing, exome and whole genome sequencing studies across all the complex diseases, uh, it's more or less become the only option. So we have a very tight interaction with analysts studying many different diseases from many different groups, and that's of course been absolutely essential to building something that would be, at the end of the day, useful for the scientific questions that uh, the analysts are interested to, to address. We're leveraging all of these open source big data tools. Many of them are part of the Apache big data stack. And, uh, and we're also you know, innovating to solve problems that are unique to genetics, which is to say that you know, I mentioned that a number of us come from math backgrounds. We're very excited about the extent to which we can build infrastructure and methods that don't just allow us to do the things that we've been doing in the past to learn from this data just with more of it, but actually take advantage of the possibilities to uh, find sort of deeper signal in the data uh, as a result of uh, having more of it and better metadata uh, to go with it. All right, so let me speak for a moment about scale. Uh, 
Uh, here's an experiment that uh, we did. Actually, this is pretty old now. It's maybe six months ago, but it illustrates the main point, which is uh, the notion of scalability, which is really core to the technologies that we're using. So here we're computing a bunch of sample QC metrics uh, like you know, call rate and mean depth and uh, TITV, these kinds of things. Uh, and we're doing it a bunch of times using a different number of cores. So we just doubled the number of cores, starting from, I think, a couple up to 1,024. So we're doubling, doubling, doubling five times. And the uh, question is, you know, how does that impact the amount of time it takes for the job to run? So if you had perfect scalability, then if you double the number of cores being used, then it should take half the time. And that's uh, the theoretical optimum, but in practice, there's always overhead. Uh, and so it's very hard to achieve that perfectly. Uh, but in this case, you know, we get pretty close. So if you double the number of cores, now we're seeing a log log plot. Uh, this, this line ideally would have slope minus one. It has slope about minus 0.8, which corresponds to doubling the cores reduces the time by a factor of 0.57. Uh, okay, so we're getting reasonable scalability. And I think the important point here is that being able to scale isn't, it's not just about time, doing it faster, right? It's also about cost and productivity. So, so here, over, if, you, if you think about, okay, how does this translate to cost? Well, using 1,024 cores is giving us uh, almost 300 times speed up. And because we don't have perfect scalability, it is costing more, it's costing about twice more. But now imagine, imagine you have a computation you wanna do and to do it on one, on, uh, you know, one core would, would take, I, or what was it, two or 32, I can't tell what the, the bottom of this, this plot is anymore. But doing it with just a few cores, you'd end up, say, taking a day. Uh, on the other hand, now you have a knob you can turn, right? And you turn this knob to use 1,024, and now uh, you get the same thing back in minutes. Or suppose that the computation using 1,024 cores, you now can do it in a day, but if you didn't have that scalability, you'd have it done in a year, which is effectively saying you'd never get it back, right? So the, the idea is to bring computations that would be impossible on big data into reasonable amounts of time, but also to bring computations that you could still do on big data, but have become completely non-interactive back to interactivity so you can actually follow up on whatever interesting leads the data tells you uh, as quickly as possible to do the best science. And I should note that in the limit of perfect scalability, right, what you end up paying for when I say cost in, in a cloud environment, you pay per core hour. So it doesn't matter whether you use a thousand computers for one hour or one computer for a thousand hours, you pay the same thing. So at the limit of perfect scalability, basically every computation can be done instantaneously for exactly the same cost. So that's what we're driving toward um, to speed up the science. All right, so let me give you some concrete examples. Uh, I mentioned Nomad. Nomad is the largest aggregated genetic data set probably on the planet. Uh, it consists of 20,000 whole genomes, 200,000 exomes. It's about 40 uh, terabytes of compressed DCF data. Yeah. And uh, actually most of that is the whole genomes, even though there's an order of magnitude fewer of them because oh, genomes are just so darn big. Uh, so Nomad actually, what they do, it's, this is the new version of Exact. The idea is uh, to, they have 100 and, so, 100 and I think 40 PIs who've contributed genotype level data privately uh, to this group, which is led by Daniel MacArthur. Uh, and then they, the idea is to jointly analyze this data set, uh, do the statistics necessary to filter it and clean it up. I hear somebody. Okay, so, uh, right, so they need to, 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 to clean it up, uh, compute a bunch of statistics, uh, do sex imputation, compute some PCs, uh, do this on, you know, not just on the entire data set, but in each subgroup of the data set, subgroup by ancestry and so on. It's a pretty diverse data set. Uh, and then create a sites file, which throws away the individual level data and, and, and gives you all these aggregate statistics for each variant. Uh, and, and then 
this backs a web portal that is very useful to clinicians and other researchers. Okay, so that's a process. Uh, and in the context of this data, uh, they had about a week to do that entire process. By the time that the, the raw joint call set was available to the time when Dana MacArthur was making this announcement at the American Society of Human Genetics uh, annual conference in Vancouver. And uh, so we worked closely with the analysts, uh, Laurent Fran Franchuli and, and also Conrad, uh, who were focused on the genomes and the exomes respectively. And using Hale, they, they were able to, in that week, do all of those computations necessary uh, in time for Daniel's talk. And, and after, and, and around the same time, Cotton actually went and you know, looked at Laurent's pipeline on the whole genomes and cleaned it up a bit, uh, simplified it a little bit. So it's not the exact same pipeline, but it's, it, it does most of what he did. Uh, and just, just to do an experiment to see how long it would take uh, if, you, if you didn't just ran this end to end, doing all of these things. And, and so he ran it once and it, it took 92 minutes using 4,000 cores on Google Cloud. And that's about five cents per sample, which is pretty reasonable in the context of the amount of investment in each of these samples uh, that went in in the first place. That being said, uh, we aren't very happy at all with the 92 minutes. We think this can be uh, much faster and we're on a roadmap to, to do that. So another concrete example, and this is more on the method side, uh, I've spent some time recently uh, adding another regression model to our toolkit, in particular linear mix model. So we have linear regression, logistic regression. Uh, the next logical step is linear mix models, which are a uh, workhorse in uh, genetic association studies, particularly when you have uh, you know, inhomogeneous populations, potentially with pedigrees of cryptically or known related individuals. And you want to control for that appropriately in order to get the most power um, and not too many false positives out of your association study. So in a linear mix model, Y here is the uh, vector of phenotypes. So imagine it's a vector of length N, where each entry records the phenotype for the i sample. So we have N samples, this is a column vector of length N, and you could perhaps think about height as a phenotype. Okay, so it's a vector of the heights of, of these N samples. And the sort of Bayesian formulation of the model is that that vector is a single draw from a multidimensional uh, Gaussian, so in this case, n-dimensional. The mean vector of that Gaussian is given by uh, the design matrix X, which are our sample level covariates. So now these are things like, could be gender and age and uh, intercept term, things like that. And then you have the weights encoded in the vector beta. So if you have, say, C covariates, then X is an n by C matrix, and beta is a vector of length C. The interesting part in a mixed model is that you have an additional term in the covariance. So in a linear regression model, you only have that second term, a multiple of the n by n identity matrix, meaning that uh, you don't expect any residual covariance uh, in between samples. Uh, and in the mixed model, you have a second term, which involves this kinship matrix K, which is a measure of pairwise sample similarity. So K is also an n by n matrix. And when people talk about estimating uh, heritability, they often are asking, if you fit this model, in particular the variance components, so fit the sigma g squared and the sigma e squared and the beta, they, the notion of narrow sensor heritability is essentially sigma g squared divided by sigma g squared plus sigma e squared. That is what proportion of the total variance is explained by genetics rather than environmental factors. All right, well, because you have all these parameters, not just the beta and the sigma g squared, but also the sigma e squared, this is not as simple to do as a standard linear regression. And actually finding the maximum likelihood solution is a non-convex optimization problem. The uh, other thing to note is, you know, you have to compute this kinship matrix in the first place. That's typically, conceptually, it's, it's essentially a, you take a bunch of uh, common variants that are spread throughout the genome, and to get the pairwise similarity between any two people, you more or less take the dot product of their genotypes for those variants. You have to mean center and variants normalize each variant, but essentially it's a dot product. So K, the matrix K, this kinship, you can think of as something like, uh, you know, G, G transpose, where G is a matrix which has the samples and it also has the genotypes at a bunch of common variants. So you have to compute K, then you have to fit sigma g and sigma e, um, these variance components. And then once you've done that, you want to go and do uh, 
single variant association analysis for all of the variants that you have enough uh, data for, meaning everything except the super rare stuff where you won't have power anyways. So here's an example. Uh, the whole genome, the 1000 Genomes Project. So it's 2,535 samples. And what we, I did was, uh, just as a test, take that data set, compute the kinship matrix using about 100,000 common variants, estimate the variance parameters, and then run a likely ratio test in this linear mixed model for each of 15 million uh, variants. That was all the variants that had a call rate above, I think, 95, 98% and had a frequency of at least 0.5%. Uh, and so doing that, uh, ran in about three minutes and 42 seconds using 680 cores and, and it cost about 50 cents. And, you know, I think that's, if you want to put those numbers in real terms, you know, essentially you're, you're, you're an analyst, you're working, okay, you want to run this model, you hit enter, you, you go to the coffee machine, you, you make your coffee and you come back and for less than the cost of the coffee pot, you, you have your answer and, and then you can proceed. So you spend much more of your time actually uh, asking questions, getting back answers, iterating, doing science, and less time waiting for jobs to complete. Uh, we've since had analysts here working on the top data set using this model. Uh, now we're talking about something like 8,000 whole genomes. That's a bigger scale. And, you know, that still runs in well under an hour and, you know, you can do your meta-analysis, having run this on all these different data sets and bringing it together you know, in a day's work rather than uh, weeks, which is the current experience using older tools, even distributed tools. Okay, so I mentioned that scale is a big part of what we're doing. It's certainly not the only part. Uh, we're also raising the level of abstraction. So this is, a, I think, another good contrast with a general programming language like, like Python or R. Which, which are amazing tools. You can do all kinds of data science, but they know nothing about genetics. And in genetics, if you are a statistical geneticist and you're talking to your colleague about a computation you want to do, you're not going to talk the way that Python code is written. You're going to say, I want to take all the variants that have this call rate and I want to run this test. Uh, and then I want to filter those samples if the genotype has this allele you know, distribution, out of bounds, whatever, right? And these are, all, these are all notions that make sense to other people in the field. And ideally, you'd like your computer to make sense of these notions and then handle all the implementation uh, on its own below that so that you can spend a lot less time writing code and a lot more time just expressing what you want to do in a few lines that you can be confident are going to do the thing you think it's doing. Um, in particular, when you have less code, you also can be more confident that the code doesn't have uh, as many bugs. Um, and because you're relying on all the sort of testing that is done, in our case, on, on the code underneath the few lines that you went, that you wrote, right? So that's sort of a whole testing framework that's in place. So you can be confident that's correct. And then you just got to worry about the three lines that you added. So in that sense, uh, Hale has all sorts of domain-specific concepts like samples, variants, alleles, genotypes, um, and so on in a sort of uh, a mini language. Uh, and the language is a declarative query language, which means you express the computation that you want to do, but don't think too hard about how it's actually going to be implemented. In particular, you don't think about how it's going to be implemented using thousands of cores, um, where the data is going to be which parts of the data are going to be where, which computations are going to be run that where, how the network's going to be used. You don't think about any of that. Um, so that's closer to a SQL-like uh, approach where SQL takes a declarative statement and then has a query optimizer that uh, figures out the most efficient way to execute your query. And then we have a number of statistical models that are common models in genetics. Uh, I think we're least developed on the sort of higher level modeling. I told you we have logistic regression, linear regression, uh, mixed models uh, coming in. We have a lot of plans to add burden, all sorts of burden tests and, and other kinds of models. Um, but I'd say where we're strongest at the moment in terms of support is all of the things people do to clean up the data and compute statistics on the data and count, you know, how many rare variants do I see in, this, in these genes and these people with these properties and so on like that. And so we've had several um, 
We have one paper published already uh, by Andrea Ghana and uh, Giulio Genovese in, in Nature Neuroscience that used HAIL to look at rare variants. Uh, and about you know, a dozen papers underway that are using, using HAIL for that kind of purpose here at the Bird. So we have support for common and rare variant analysis and also uh, for reading and writing from you know, all the standard formats of genetic data annotations that, that people tend to use. That means things like variant calling files, plink files, that would be like bim, bam, fam, uh, bgen files, which is what UK Biobank uses. You can bring in TSVs, JSON, uh, and you can export all of these formats. And then our infrastructure will, will, will sort of handle it. Um, internally, I should say that the data that's in a variant call file is not, um, we have an import step for any of these formats, you sort of have an import step into our internal representation which is a distributed representation, you know, bit compressed and, um, and distributed uh, and so on. So there is a stage where you have to kind of bring it into our, our distributed world. Uh, and then if you want to bring it back out, there's an export. So as a toolkit, uh, some examples that, were, uh, that I can give you to, to back up the claim that it allows you to write less code is uh, Kyle Satterstrom and Mark Daly's group. So he's been doing the uh, iPsych loss of function burden analysis projects, uh, and that involves 8,000 exomes. The original code that he was using involved 800 lines of Python and took days to weeks of real time to, to execute end to end, sometimes because you had to, to restart things and true them many times. Uh, and the same thing he's now rewritten in, in 65 lines in Hale, and it's about a thousand times faster. The, another nice example is Caitlin Samocha's uh, de novo variant calling method. It's a published method. And in the published version, 1,500 lines of Python. Uh, we, we wrote that in Scala, which is the language we implement HAL in, uh, in about 150 lines. And it's about 250 times faster. The uh, near-term goal is actually to get down, down to 20 lines, not written in Scala, which uh, an analyst wouldn't do necessarily, but actually written in the language we expose as the Hale language. And um, we're very close to, to realizing that. I, I should also mention that um, right now we're going, going, undergoing a transition. So originally our tool in terms of an analyst using it was at the command line. So they'd write kind of bash scripts uh, as pipelines. The transition that we're almost finished with actually it's done except for the documentation of it is we move the front end entirely to Python and we're actually going to get rid of the command line version very, very soon. Uh, the advantage of this is that then we can rely on Python to do all the parsing and then you can integrate much more effectively with all the other rich data science tools that Python gives you things like uh, NumPy, scikit-learn, matplotlib. Uh, it's very similar to uh, if, you're, if any of you have used Spark, uh, there's a notion of PySpark, which allows you to use IPython notebooks to interact with Spark, which runs all the distributed computation. So we're moving the whole front end to Python as we speak. As a platform, uh, there are analysts who have engineering backgrounds or are excited to go in that direction who are trying to build new methods uh, at the level of writing Scala code. Uh, and these would become then modules that other analysts could then use and plug into their pipelines. So Laurent Pancioli is part of Daniel's group doing Mendelian disease research. He's written an expectation maximization framework to find novel genes um, in EXAC, uh, novel genes in terms of uh, disease risk for rare disease, also a random forest approach using the MLlib library that Spark offers as a machine learning, distributed machine learning library. Uh, and this is an approach he's using to do variant filtering. Uh, Mitra Kirke is extending statistics in his work called RAF statistics to compound heads. So this is, these are analysts who are going to write Java or Scala and, and bring new functionality that can then be used by others. We're also using Hale to support a bunch of project infrastructure. So for example, I wrote a backend for the type 2 diabetes portal and Locusum being developed here at Broad and at Michigan, which dynamically computes linear regression p-values in an association context for uh, thousands of uh, diabetes whole genomes. The way it's able to do that dynamically in real time is uh, in the Locusum portal, you're only focused on a window of about, uh, say, half a megabase in the genome, looking at a gene or two. But then you can do things like 
change the phenotype or add in another variant for conditional analysis or change the covariates and you instantly see the p-values uh, move around accordingly uh, as that's being recomputed. Instantly is a bit of a stretch because there's, there's other issues of um, you know, updating the, the image on the screen and the network communication and so on. The, the part that actually happens in Hale uh, takes less than a second though, and, and there's improvements sort of at each of these levels of the stack that are being worked on to make it truly interactive uh, through a browser. The Seeker platform for rare disease genomics in the MacArthur Lab, there the idea is not to do computations over all the data, but to do very complex SQL-like queries to pull out uh, particular combinations of features in a bunch of genomes uh, based on what people are looking for in a rare disease context. And that's actually the project where we're combining our backend with technologies like Cassandra and Solar, which is about distributed databases and search to make it essentially a distributed search engine to find instances of variants which have certain properties among all the data. Another cool project is the Universal Control Repository Network in the Neil Lab, that's also called Unicorn. There the idea is to uh, aggregate controls across lots of studies to use as a, a repository so that if you want to go do a new study, you don't need to uh, go and spend half your money collecting new controls, but rather you just spend all your money on cases and then you interface with this repository in a way that gives you expected rates of variance, variation at sites in your controls, uh, sorry, in your cases, so that you can go ahead and do these association studies, which is to say, I have a case and I wanna say, given my case, with whatever their ancestry may be, what do I expect to see at this position in the genome? And that's compared to what you actually observe and you check for association with phenotype. And you can do this in a fully privacy preserving way, uh, but the actual backend that does the computation uh, on the, all this massive control set, that's, that's currently uh, starting to be developed and, and hail. All right, so I think that's the end of my talk. I mean, looking toward the future, what we're trying to build here, and you know, we're only, we're a year in, we're, we're excited about the parts we've made, but you know, every other day we feel like, gosh, there's just like so many things that we want to do that would make this thing better, this, the other, and, and more features and, and so on. So it's, it's a process, but we're very excited about what's happening and, and the future. The goal really here is to build a very collaborative open source framework uh, to enable the global research community to rapidly develop, apply, share, and iterate on methods for learning from genetic data at scale. And I, on an open science sort of point of view, I, I think sharing and iterating is, is really one of the, the crucial points because as the data gets large, if as a community we develop methods by writing R libraries or Python you know, modules, by the time your paper comes out and the data's doubled again, it, it's quite likely that, that what you wrote while mathematically correct, is, is only a toy model with respect to the computations and the scale of the data that it would be ideal to run it on. And so even though in, in principle, your code is public, you have this, this library, it, it, it's not usable, uh, at least not for big data anymore. And so if we want to have an open science reproducible kind of culture, then we need to think about building methods in a context where you can share that method in a way that anyone can easily bring it in and apply it uh, at scale and combine it with other things and change it and share it. And so, you know, I, I don't think we've by any means perfected our APIs or our infrastructure yet to make that, you know, as easy as we'd like it to be, but that's a niche that we're hoping Hale can, can contribute to. The website is hail.is, hail.is, um, where you can learn what hail is. There's uh, the main website, documentation. Uh, there's a forum, like Stack Exchange type forum, chat rooms for general users and developers. The GitHub repository, again, it's totally open source. Uh, if you want to contribute to uh, the code, you can fork it. Uh, you can make pull requests. You can interact with us in the chat rooms and the forum. And uh, with that, I just say there are a lot of a lot of folks who have both worked directly on the software project and the Hill team led by Cotton and then within the broader genetics community here 
uh, and Ben Neal in particular, RPI. And of course, like without that community, we would just have no idea how to build anything useful uh, to do the science. So that's been extremely uh, satisfying part of all this. And now there's 15 minutes left, so I'll stop. What do I do to get sound? Um, thank you very much. You just have an, um, to stop sharing your screen on top, and if you go with your cursor on the top in the middle. And if everyone has questions, um, just keep in mind that you have to unmute yourself. Echo. Go ahead. So it seems that there are a lot of uh, formats and a lot of new features coming up. So will Hale eventually be able to replace GATK? That's a great question. OK, Hale will not replace GATK. Uh, because Hale is focused on, it, not, not focused on the same problems as GATK. So they solve one problem very well, which is, uh, sequencing genomes, and we are focused on a different problem, which is once you have a bunch of sequenced genomes, what do you do with it? So in some sense, they start from the BAM and go to the BCF, and we start from the BCF together with phenotypes and uh, variant annotation data and so on, and now ask what can we learn about, about disease, right? So in, in particular, we interact a lot with, GT, with DISD, the data scientist group here, and GTK in the context of how do we make it as clean as possible and as efficient as possible to kind of go through that stack that starts at the samples going into the sequencers, then proceeds through the computational pipelines, then in principle proceeds to hail and, and allows scientists to easily learn from the data. This is the question more like uh, when um, should we stop using Plink? Uh, that's a good question, too. Uh, I, I'm obviously biased. I think uh, for if Hale does the things that you need to do already that Plink does, you should be using Hale now. Because even if Plink does it, uh, Hale will do it faster. And that saves you uh, time that you could use to do more science. Uh, now, this isn't true necessarily for data that's small enough to fit on your laptop. Plink is, especially Plink 2, is, is sort of hand optimized vectorized C code. It's, it's very hard to compete with that. And, uh, you know, when we're dealing, we're writing Scala and Java and so on, and doing distributed architecture and all this. So if you have a data set that fits in your laptop uh, and you're doing something that Plink already does, chances are Plink is going to be faster on, uh, you know, on one core. On the other hand, uh, I'll tell you, for linear regression, right, if you compare head-to-head Hale running on one core on your laptop for linear regression to Plink, Plink 2, uh, as soon as you get to maybe four or five covariates, Hale is faster. And that's because we're also bringing in mathematics that you know, does certain things right on, how do I say it? If you're, if you're going to do a computation a million times, and there's some element of it that you could do once and then feed the answer to each of those million other computations so those later ones can each be shorter, then you win. And so doing those kinds of things intelligently and using, in particular, sparse encodings, so Plink, at least the public version of Plink 2, it's, uh, you know, it's compressed, but it's still a dense encoding because you have four genotypes per byte, two bits for each. And so if you imagine you have a variant, and now we're talking about sequencing data, for example, where the average variant can be extremely rare. So almost all of those bits are zero. But you still have to deal with the I.O. of reading them in, and, and you're going to have a dense vector, and you're going to do dense linear algebra. What we're doing in that context is we can threshold. We can say, OK, well, if it's, if the, if it's a rare variant, let's, let's not only uh, store it sparsely, but let's read it in and that sparse representation as a sparse array and then we'll do sparse linear algebra and you know you win and so i guess that's the point if your data is tiny and in many cases you know plink is still going to win but there are some cases where we even win in that context and if your data is large 
then uh, you're kind of out of luck uh, with Plink. And I, at this point, there's very little of the core functionality that Plink does, I think, that we don't cover. We're right now adding LD pruning, which is a pretty important aspect of the workflow for a lot of people. So that's, that's coming into master, I think, in the next week. Uh, we do very fast uh, TDT. Uh, not TDT, sorry. And we do do TDT, transmission equilibrium tests, but we also we do um, IBD, the IBD matrix. So when we first implemented that, it was really slow and it was sad. Uh, and, and ultimately that was because, you know, we're, 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 we were treating genotypes as, <laughs> as, as integers, 32-bit things, and, and uh, you know, you're doing all these identity by state computations. It's a giant distributed matrix problem. Uh, so Daniel King in our group went and kind of was inspired in some ways by the Plink code uh, and then just did a lot of similar tricks to vectorize, uh, to, to basically com compress the computation so you can pack all these genotypes using a few number of bits and do the computation down in the registers in this vectorized way, make it much faster. So now our IBD, for example, I think is competitive with Plink, but can, can run on a terabyte of data. Okay, one last question for, for, for example, if people with PIs watch this and they are not really hands-on bioinformaticians. What does an institute need um, to run Hale? Great. Okay, so Hale is ultimately using uh, Scala and, and, and Spark, uh, which in turn are compiling down to the Java virtual machine. What that means is you need Java. So Java, you can download for free, open versions or Oracle's version, Java's no issue. Uh, that means you can run it on your laptop. If you run it on your laptop, you'll take advantage of all the cores on your laptop immediately. Uh, but for most computations, you're not gonna wanna run it on your laptop. So then the two options become, uh, either you have, uh, say, a high, uh, high performance computing cluster on hand, where it is possible you can go and set up a Spark cluster on top of that. Uh, we've done that here at the Broad. Uh, it's not the most efficient set up because, like I mentioned earlier, having this centralized storage uh, is not really the Spark model. The Spark model is that your data is stored in a distributed way and your compute happens where the data is. And the network, to the extent it needs to, does share intermediate results, they move across the network, but you're really trying to minimize the amount of data that's being sent over the network. And when you have centralized storage, you might scale to tons of cores, but you still have to move all that data out of centralized storage to the cores and maybe move it back and, and all this stuff. Um, but it is totally possible and it will get you, you know, it, some of the advantages. The more optimal setup is having, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, commodity computers, each with some RAM and some disk. And this is what vendors like Amazon and Google have invested a ton of money in making uh, as a public uh, service. So most of the computation being done now at the Broad on these big sequencing data sets and studies is actually done uh, on Google's cloud at the moment. Mm -hmm. It could be Amazon, it could be Google, we've done both, it doesn't really matter, but, but it so happens that you know, the data is sitting in Google buckets and uh, in the varying data set, so that our internal representations are saved out, distributed, and when you wanna go do something, it gets sucked in in parallel, the computation happens, you export some result, and if you want information about how to start using, uh, in particular, Google's cloud with Hale, there's extensive documentation on the discussion forum. So if you go to the hail.is and you click on the, the forum tab at the top, that'll take you to our kind of stack exchange style forum. And one of the posts is using hail on the Google Cloud platform. And that was written by uh, some of the analysts here who have been doing that around the clock lately to analyze XAC and Nomad. Uh, and so that can get you started. And if you have trouble, then you sh should totally uh, come to the chat rooms and uh, contact us in whatever way. Okay, so we have like three more minutes. Are there any questions? So um, this is Ram here from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, you guys mentioned a little bit about the uh, de novo framework and um, uh, using Hale and CCAR. Um, I was wondering, will this be towards um, like for uh, like Gemini, like, you know, will it evolve like a Gemini-like framework? I don't know what Gemini is. Oh, the Gemini is the uh, is a framework from like Aaron Quinlan's lab in the University of Virginia, uh, University of Utah, uh, which is mainly focused on trio-based or um, like um, Mendelian, like you know, handling Mendelian diseases. Uh, 
Great. So uh, currently, with regard to trios and Mendelian diseases, the main functionality we have is, you know, you can bring in pedigrees uh, in the form of trios, not general pedigrees yet. Uh, you can do, uh, you know, the equivalent of Mendel errors in Plank. So find all the Mendel errors that exist and have aggregate statistics by, by locus or by uh, individual or trio. And, and also the transmission disequilibrium test. We are thinking a lot, I think Tim Paterba, especially on our team, is thinking a lot about what the general framework for uh, doing TRIO type analyses and more general pedigree analyses uh, is going to look like going forward in HAIL because we're not satisfied with what we have so far. Uh, but So absolutely we want a, a very general and useful framework for that kind of analysis. And I think the, the right abstractions are even more general. That is to say, you know, we currently have as our core data structure, this notion of a variant data set, which is very much a two dimensional uh, object where you have an axis that's variance and an axis that's samples. But, you know, ultimately you really want to be able to group by key in any way you like. So instead of imagining your keys as samples, they could be trios, or an invariance, instead of them being variants, they could be genes or intervals or any other kinds of sets of variants, for example. Uh, last week, we brought in our first primitives to help us do these things, uh, which are called key tables, and they enable arbitrary uh, aggregation by key uh, and groupings by keys, but it isn't as well connected to there's sort of a specialization of that to make it very easy to do trio stuff that we are definitely planning to do, um, but it's sort of not, not happened yet. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, I think the, the homepage is there. Um, everyone can like, look in the forum if there are any more questions. Um, John, this was very detailed, thank you very much. And everyone, I wish you a nice weekend and I would put the talk like in like two or three hours online. Thanks everyone. Okay, bye-bye.